people just wanted a democracy. You know, it's a very hodgepodge. The U.S. was kind of hopeful about Castro, but when he went to the United States a few months after taking power, there he is on time, and met with Vice President Richard Nixon, Nixon came out believing that Castro was a communist. And the reason why was land reform. Remember land reform? You give land to the peasants. Castro wanted that and also wanted mining and tin and the tin industry there to uh, leave money in Cuba. He's a nationalist. He's also a communist. And almost immediately after that, oh, this is a funny picture. Here he is with Ed Sullivan, who had the most popular variety show in America at that time. He had Elvis on a few years earlier. He had the Beatles on four years earlier, or four years later. But I just think that's a funny picture. Almost immediately there, the CIA began working on another plan like they did in Guatemala to make an exile army to attack Cuba. And so, almost immediately, the problem was that plan would not be ready before the election of 1960. We'll come back to the plan, but there is a plan. And you want to see a great picture? I know you all do. It's dressed like Fidel Castro. It took those kids months to grow those beards. That's a great picture. And so we're coming to the election of 1960, which was a true Cold War election. And the Democrats... Now, the campaigns are nothing like today. There are a few primaries, but it's not this continuous campaign. A few prominent Democrats wanted to run for president, but John Kennedy, using his father's wealth, but also just understanding to get his name out there fast, he actually really surprised people and would win the nomination. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, JFK, copying FDR. Surprising everybody, the Senate Majority Leader from Texas. Who did a half run for president? He was hoping that they would just kind of miss but didn't get it. Surprising everybody, Lyndon Bay Johnson, or LBJ, took the vice presidency. Johnson was the most powerful Senate Majority Leader in American history. The second most powerful man in Washington, D.C. by 1960. The vice president doesn't do anything. This is a real step down. But he took it anyway, who knows what personal reasons for party unity. Kennedy's uh, from Massachusetts, LBJ is from Texas. They split the, you know, they get the country. Both are economically liberal. They're both cold warriors. The Republicans nominated Richard Nixon. And even though Nixon tried to reinvent himself as the new Nixon, as kind of a kinder, gentler Nixon, he saw the reputation, remember I told you, of Tricky Dick. But the thing was, he was seen as very, very competent and experienced, while Kennedy had the reputation of being a playboy. Kennedy had the reputation of being a lightweight. Both served in the military in World War II, but Kennedy was a war hero. He was the commander of a patrol boat, a torpedo boat, they called him, called it PT and PT 109. And in 43, it was rammed by and sunk by a Japanese destroyer. And even though he was hurt very bad, his back was, he was in agony the rest of his life. He was on a cocktail of pain medication to just get him through the day. That was kept secret from most people. He saved two of his crew members by swimming a mile to shore with them, under one under each arm, and still saved their lives. And then, in combination of swimming and using a canoe, were able to rescue the, get, um, get help for the rest of his crew who were on a deserted island. And so Kennedy was the real deal. PT 109, there'd be a movie. It was a big deal. But other than that, Kennedy was seen as a total lightweight. And few people knew how sick he was. He portrayed this very fit and vigorous man, and he was really sick. He had been given the last rites three times in his life. Yeah. Okay, so what was Nixon's Tricky Dick. Because he'd be known as doing any dirty trick to win an election. And as it would turn out by 1968 and 72, he would do anything. Anything. And in 68, when I tell you that, that would be the reason why I despise Richard. 
The people I like and dislike and interesting character characters, Nixon. But Kennedy, 40, well, it was 48 and 58, he nearly died. And had he got the last rights. He would also get the last rights in 63 after he was assassinated. And he missed a lot of time in the Senate. He lost a lot of weight. He was really sick. He was on this cocktail of chemicals to keep him going, and he was taking steroids because he was almost cadaverous. He was so skinny to make him look fit. And they portray this as this fit, vigorous man sailing or playing touch football with his family. He was really an ill man. Well, and I think that brush with death combined with chemicals and just who he was would make him a the, maybe the most notorious philanderer in presidential history. Not saying a lot. He had uh, thousands of affairs. Well, one of the things that Democrats used was the missile gap. Remember the bomber gap back in 52? The missile gap was because the Republicans, because they were soft on communism, Eisenhower and his new look. And look at Cuba. They just Cuba's now communist. The communists are winning everywhere, but especially Spock. The Soviets now have more long-range missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles or ICBMs, that can reach the United States. We are vulnerable because the Republicans. So the Democrats are playing the same trick. But boy, this is not kind of a scary trick. You can buy a model. This is after the 70s, but the American ICBMs, or this is the 80s. And Soviet ICBMs. I believe that's the Satan missile. The missile right here is the one from Montana, the Minute Man. So plastic one. Yes. I'm pretty sure in, in Russian you know, it, it would be pronounced something slightly different, but it's the Satan. Or maybe it might be a good point. And people believe it because of Sputnik. And because of national security, the Republicans couldn't say anything. And so they just pushed it, pushed it. Kennedy's campaign really was pushing for dramatically increasing defense spending. Well, there was a missile gap. And the missile gap was huge. And one country was absolutely terrified by this missile gap. What's the missile gap? Yeah. The United States had over 100 ICBMs by then. They also had medium range missiles like this, at, or the Atlas had for the ICBM, but like Thor and Jupiter missiles that were in, in Italy and Turkey. And we also had over a thousand long range bombers. The Soviets had virtually no bombers, and anybody want to guess how many ICBMs they had on election day in 1960? Guesses, I'm taking them right now. You're so close. One. They had one. Not they had a lot of other weapons, but. There was a huge gap, but people were so convinced that the United States was behind that they believed it. Also, the first ever televised, actually the first ever presidential debate will happen this year. Kennedy would be Kennedy would challenge Nixon. And Nixon like, yeah, I'm gonna wipe the floor off. Uh, uh, and most people thought that Nixon would win easily. Nixon seemed more experienced, more knowledgeable. Kennedy was a lightweight and a playboy. He had no record in Congress, which actually is a big benefit for Kennedy. All Kennedy has to do is show up on that stage and not drool, and he probably will be considered, hey, Kennedy did okay. It's always a problem. The expectations are really high for you. It's, it's hard. It's a lot harder. But Nixon accepted this, and this will forever change politics. This debate is going to show how television will shape images and make individual campaigns much more important than ever were before. And remember we talked about this, I've mentioned things like this before. The first real image campaign, that log cabin campaign in 1840, Harrison and Van, Van Buren. 1896, how important money was, with McKinley having all this money over William Jennings Bryan. 1932, and Roosevelt's beautiful speaking voice on the radio. 52, and Eisenhower using the those first television ads, and now this. This will complete the circuit. If you have the money, if you can get your person on there and mold him, you can win an election. So let's watch just a little bit of this. This is from the American Experience on Richard Nixon. So it just covers a little bit of it. 
As he mapped out an ambitious 50-state campaign, he was challenged by his opponent, John F. Kennedy, to a series of televised debates, the first in American history. Even when hospitalized for two weeks with a knee injury, Nixon remained confident, anxious for the debates to begin, eager once again to use television to talk directly to the voters. At the time, there was a feeling that this overall might be a mismatch. Nixon was the candidate who had more prominence, who had been a member of the House, a member of the Senate, and the Vice President of the United States. Kennedy, he didn't have a particularly uh, strong reputation right in here. Congress. He, there was some feeling that he was, to some extent, a playboy, <laughs> that he wasn't too serious a senator. Oh, yeah. So oh, I think people about. felt that Nixon had the edge. And I think Nixon felt that he had the edge. Oh, yeah. The candidates need no introduction. The Republican candidate, Vice President Richard M. Nixon, and the Democratic candidate, Senator John F. Kennedy. According to rules set by the candidate. Now, a couple of things about this really quick. First off, when Nixon was getting out of his limousine, he banged that knee, and it's an agony. He is just like, oh, it was killing him. And he lost 20 pounds, so a suit is a little big on him. And the style of suits in the late 50s, early 60s, were tan or gray suits. He has a gray suit because that's what people wore. But think about it, especially on black and white TV. Does he almost blend in? It looks like he has a disembodied head kind of floating there. And both men said, they made a big deal, we're not going to wear makeup. We're men. Men don't wear makeup. Well, Kenny just snuck into the bathroom and they put makeup on him. Because TVs, the cameras catch everything. Especially today, but obviously then too. And then Nixon, well, Nixon on another issue. He is pale, I guess pale from being in the hospital, but also he's one of those guys who had a five o'clock shower. You know what I mean? You know, he did that old slight beard. In fact, he's really had a thick beard. He basically grunt and there would be a beard. And so he constantly had this worry that it would start kind of getting darker, especially on a white face, you're really white and pale. Have you ever heard of Nair? It's a really nasty chemical that mostly, mostly for women now, but it kind of dissolves hair. Well, they had something would use the same chemical called shave stick. And think about like a stick deodorant. And a stick like that, and you would smear it on your face. And supposedly it kept down a five o'clock shadow. I think it just made you stink because it smelled really bad. Well, they put that stuff on it, thinking that would reduce the shadow. Think about putting white paste on already a pale face. And then Nixon had another issue that a lot of people have. He sweated a lot. Which do people sweat? But with all the lights in a relatively primitive, to our point of view, TV cameras, and in all that light, think how hot it would be. So when Nixon got up there, all these things are happening. He started talking. He already looks pale and just kind of just bad. And then he started to sweat. And then the shave stick started to kind of shimmer. And we'll see a couple where his face is kind of shiny. Then glops started falling on the suit. People started calling up their local TV stations and saying, my God, help this man, he's dying. This is gonna have, up to this time, the biggest TV audience in history. This debate is a big deal. What's the biggest, it's not anymore the biggest. What are the two biggest? No, Obama's not even close. It's just relatively big now. But back then, you know, we only had three networks. One was brand new called ABC. The Beatles on Ed Sullivan. And then the landing on the moon. Make sense? I thought meant debate. Yeah. Oh, no, no, not debate. Oh, I thought you meant debate. Yeah. No, the debates now didn't come close. That's why I said Obama. Oh, I'm sorry. I said that on TV. I thought maybe in like Obama's, like, I was thinking inauguration. Yeah. Who is Nixon or? Who is what? Who's sick? Well, Nixon, Nixon is Nixon has his own staff infection, but JFK is actually a very ill man. Oh. But he looks very healthy. He's juicing. He's on, he's on steroids. He'd be suspended today. Can you not be on steroids Yeah, you, I'm just joking. Oh well, yeah, I know that's what I did. Candidates <laughs> themselves. Each man the Nixon-Kennedy debates would forever change the way Americans chose their presidents. Political rallies and old-fashioned handshaking became much less important 
than the image on the television screen. You must understand that Nixon himself had said, I don't want any makeup on for this, these particular debates. What I tried to explain to Dick was he has a certain characteristics of his skin where it's almost transparent. And it was a very nice very thought shy. to say, uh, you know, I don't want any makeup, but that he really needed it in order to have what we would call even an acceptable television yes, picture. And of course, JFK, here he'd been riding in motorcades all over California with the top down. He looked like a bronze warrior when he came into Chicago. He really did. Mr. Nixon comes out of the Republican Party. He was nominated by it. And it is a fact that through most of these last 25 years, the Republican leadership has opposed federal aid for education, medical care for the aged. I know what it means to like be I know what it means to see people who are unemployed. I know Senator Kennedy feels as deeply about these problems as I do. But our disagreement is not about the goals for America, but only about the means to reach those goals. The first debate was costly to Nixon. The radio audience thought he had won, but the largest television audience in history had seen the vice president haggard and drawn and had been given its first sustained look at the Kennedy style. Okay, so Kennedy came across on TV as the victor. And it showed how important just that image was, the feeling of it. Now the radio audience is really close. Kennedy turned out to be much better than people thought, which actually did really hurt Nixon. Kennedy did a, a good job, and he kind of cheated. They weren't supposed to talk about domestic affairs, and Kennedy did. But this is huge. Image. And after this, every presidential candidate, and then every other office down, as much as they can afford, is going to try to portray that image. They do three more debates, but they weren't near as important. And both debates, both men had dark suits on, take the makeup on. In fact, uh, Nixon almost looked, looked like he was made out of plastic in the next debate. He had so much makeup on. And now they all have makeup. And they all try to you know, cover the blemishes and whatever it might be. And Think about dark suits. See every male running for office, and also every man and woman. They usually have a dark suit on. That starts in the 1960s debate. It just is stuck with it. But think about it now. Everybody saw this. If you can portray that image, you get ad men to run your jobs, advertising executives, campaign managers that are now involved in creating and shaping an image. You get focus groups. You try to get them to say what response that I give is most appealing to you. And you say those words, you shape this image. That becomes more important. And what we gotta get out of this is, if image is more important, then money is more important than ever before. Ever before. And it's gonna get more and more and more. As long as you have money, you can shape that image and at the same time give your opponent a, a more negative image. And it's gonna be in presidential campaigns that the most money will be, but it's money, and that idea will become even more important on the under elections, where the, the candidates are not as well known. Like, for example, I mean, whether it be House and the Senate or the State House, the State Senate, Governor, State's Supreme Court. If you got the money to shape an image, just a little bit of an image in a, an election that most people don't pay attention to, you can win. Money is going to become more important than ever. Parties, what you got to get here is parties going to get weaker. And what else is going to get weaker? Candidates. From now on, especially. What do they got to be good at? Speaking, or at least speaking in such a way that, that reflects their image. Because like George W. Bush was not a great speaker, but he, he spoke in a way that reflected the image he wanted to portray. What else? Yeah, they got to look good. Campaign good. Do that not a government? No. It doesn't mean you have to know anything about governing. John Kennedy could get nothing passed. But he looked good. Barack Obama has real problems getting things passed. He has real problems understanding how to actually govern in a way you know, to get laws passed and get things done. But he understood campaigning. You see this with a lot of candidates. A lot. They're the most, you know, here and the most recent one. Uh, George W. Bush, in a way, a little bit too, but it's a big deal. Money now is everything. And so, this would be enough to propel him to victory. It 
incredibly close election. I don't know if you can see the numbers, but look at the popular vote. 120,000 votes separated them, 0.1%. That's nothing. Just a few votes different in Illinois, and Nixon would have been elected president. That's how close the election was. Razor thin. Eisenhower, though, Oh, I should add one more little story. Eisenhower, remember I told y'all, remember I told y'all Eisenhower hated Nixon? In September of 1960, Eisenhower was asked, so Richard Nixon's been your vice been your vice president. Very experienced. What initiatives has Richard Nixon done while vice president? And Eisenhower said, give me a moment, maybe I'll think of one. And of course, Kennedy immediately had that as a campaign commercial. Wouldn't you? I just know it was an interrupt. He just hated it. It was this weird kind of passive aggressive test again, Nixon. Who, uh, by the way, then, remember now Eisenhower's son in law, was, or daughter in law, was Richard Nixon's daughter. They were in laws. Every president gets a farewell address. Most of it, not a big deal. Every president of the time, obviously. The two most famous farewell address, remember we've had this one before back in 1797. When George Washington gave his farewell address, warning against the the really nasty partisan politics of that era, the Republicans and the Federalists, he also warned against no entanglement in foreign affairs. I hope that little thing I just told you sounds familiar. Dwight Eisenhower also gave his farewell address. Actually, we're not going to listen to it, but in it, Dwight Eisenhower, seeing how close we came to war, how Paris and all these efforts of peace failed. Eisenhower, in his farewell address, warned the public of what he called the industrial military complex. The industrial military complex. And he's talking about this increased defense spending, the Cold War, and what kind of country that's going to lead to. He was very worried. Yes, he was anti communist, but he's worried we're going to start just, well, let me get to it. He said there would be a cabal, a group, basically a general, the military, fear the industrial military complex. Arms manufacturers are making a lot of money, military because you get you know, you have bigger army, more generals, more admirals, but also politicians who are getting their money on this and using it for cheap political stunts to say I'm tough on communism. Remember the whole thing about tough on communism? They will exaggerate the Soviet threat to make more weapons, make more equipment, make more money, power, and that's going to lead to war. In fact, he warned that to get more power and more wealth for politicians, generals, and arms manufacturers, we'll go to more wars. We keep on this path and exaggerating the Soviet threat will be a constant war, and a small little group will be running the country. So, this is the actual quote where he says about the military industrial complex. And here's from this, and I took this from somebody else, but he said this in his speech, and it should remind you about the new look. Remember, I told you about it was fearful, big defense spending. Oh, yeah, we got to do it, he said. He was very worried about the future. And some listened, but for the most part, nobody listened. Because nobody wanted to be accused of being soft on what? And now, today, it's soft on what? Yeah. And we greatly exaggerate the threat today. In fact, basically, after the Soviet Union disappeared, we found new threats. We greatly exaggerate the terrorists and the ISIS and the threat from ISIS. ISIS is the one that just blows me away. This horrible little group of cutthroats and pirates, awful people. But they are absolutely no threat to the United States of America. You know, we're the most powerful country in the world. I mean, there are a bunch of animals that if we want stability in the Middle East, we're gonna have, probably going to have to help figure out some way for them to get rid of them. And they are actually winning against ISIS. ISIS is crumbling. But, exaggerating, people are talking about that. I was sitting in the Chico Hot Springs, and the people across from us were eating. They're from California, and they had kids going to balls. And so you back I hear them talking, and they're going, well, you don't want to go to Germany. You know, ISIS will get you. And, you know, ISIS is attacking all over California now. What? I mean, they're just so scared of them. Yeah, they're, they're, 
terrorism is an issue, it's a threat, but they're not gonna defeat the United States. They gotta be realistic and honest. And he warned against it. Well, JFK's president. And JFK, his program, great program, great idea, the new frontier. Well, I'm not saying that the program is good, I mean, you make up your own mind about that, but new frontier because it's implying new, different, exciting, he's the youngest man ever elected president, first president born, who wasn't born in the 20th, oh, sorry, first president born in the 20th century, but it also reminds you of the new frontier, is continuing the, and yeah, the Democrats will make a conscious decision in the early 70s to go away from the New Deal. Boy. I would argue politically that was a terrible mistake. But anyways, this is the basic idea of it. He had a long list of things. This should remind you of the New Deal, the Fair Deal, civil rights. Medicare would be health insurance for the elderly. It was, he was being cautious, not health insurance for everybody, one step at a time. Because elderly, health insurance for them, significantly more expensive. Because they need more health care. Education. Why flat was already really affecting cities? Raise the minimum wage dramatically. It's been stagnant throughout the 50s. Nothing like today. Tax cuts, but Keynesian tax cuts that would be designed for the most part to continue or to give the tax breaks to lower, to lower tax levels. Anti-poverty, but also a massive increase in defense spending. That was the new frontier. It's very much a continuation of Truman and FDR. Yeah. yeah, dramatically increased the pencil. Yeah, Eisenhower, remember what I said, no one listened to Eisenhower. But the reason why is Eisenhower taught to be so prophetic in so many ways. Look in the newspaper, there's a plane called the F-35. It's in the paper today. And they're trying to say, oh, we finally got the plane to work. We're just building it. It's a $391 billion program. And the plane is an absolute disaster. But they're still pushing, making this thing. Because people are making a lot of money. That's pretty amazing. It's supposed to replace bombers. That actually, the old bombers are better. And old fighters are better. It's shocking. But that's the industrial military complex. What? It's news now. Well, it was supposed to like do everything, have one engine that's really powerful, have all these avionics. It's, it, it's, it could turn out to be the worst disaster of, of a military expenditure in history. We got a lot of them. We made a lot of really bad stuff. Worthless. But that is it. I should tell you two things. First off, to give you an idea how much parties have changed because of money and influence of that, how parties have changed, Kennedy, who economically is, we consider you know, li very liberal economics, very Keynesian, very pro civil rights. To idea economically, he would be very comparable today to a vanilla candidate. Yeah, Bernie Sanders. In some ways, more liberal than Sanders, in some ways, more conservative. And he was very mainstream of the Democratic Party then. He's significantly more liberal than Hillary Clinton. And, well, put it this way, Nixon's significantly more liberal than every Republican party. Significantly. During the Great Depression that era, the country was much more liberal. People within the United States, the actual people might not be, it's actually pretty similar, but the, the leaders of both parties are very conservative compared to that. And, Kennedy was horrible at getting bills passed. He could not work with Congress. He could, LBJ, who was some master of it now, no one cares about it, he's vice president. Which one of these passed? The things. That's it, the only one he got. Kennedy would get his defense built up. The largest peacetime military build up in history up to that time, and the second largest in history. The largest was during the Reagan administration in 81. A massive buildup in defense. A massive buildup in not only nuclear weapons, but also conventional weapons. And Kennedy loved these new units. In fact, they used to always call commandos all the time, a buildup of rangers and special forces. 
They dubbed after the hats they wore, what hat did they wear? Special Forces, anyone know? Green Berets. They don't want copies of French, they got to wear Berets. And the Kennedy loved that stuff. There's a myth that's going to happen by the late 1960s that exists to this day that if Kennedy would not have been assassinated, the U.S. would not have involved in the Vietnam War. And he would have ended the arms race. There's absolutely no evidence of that. Kennedy was a cold warrior and he was a politician. He couldn't afford to look soft on communism. It's hard, it's hard to even comprehend Kennedy doing significantly different than LBJ did, which is also, looking back at it, been very sad. Well, moving on, defense spending. There would be a couple programs that actually show great promise, especially Alliance for Progress. Alliance for Progress, and this is in Latin America where this is, this picture, but it's going to be to help these third world developing countries build up their economies. And it's related to the Peace Corps, which was a tiny program but had a lot of publicity, where young, energetic, intelligent Americans would go all over the world, the developing world, and help educate and modernize these countries. And they had limited success. Here is Kennedy meeting with the first Peace Corps volunteers. They both, though, got to be clear about it, intensely Cold War programs, anti-communist. Think about it. We send the young, the best and the brightest from America, it makes the American system look good, don't become communists. We help build up their economies, they don't become communists. These are Cold War programs. Alliance for, Pro for Progress would be blown away by the um, catastrophe that's going to be the Vietnam War. But the Peace Corps is still around. And it's still very much a propaganda arm of the United States Army, even though it does, uh, it's very small, but does good things. I remember looking into it, but the, for various reasons, I did not, I decided I did not want to do that. Mostly fear of parasites. I used to be absolutely repulsed by the idea of just, I'm not, I mean, okay, then I like parasites, so kind of cool. No. And especially the flies in Africa, like TC flies in those Atlanta, you and later eggs inside you. Then the larva grows and then pops out. I decided I could not take it. Has anyone ever seen that? I thought someone went back, went to Africa, came back and showed me one. Larva pops out. Ah! Yeah, totally alien. You never told us about this I will, but I would say it. I say it. <laughs> After, let me get, let me get time, I'll, I'll take it in and I'll tell you nothing but stories, okay? What? No, it's just funny. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'll tell you all my LBJ stories, which, is, which are awesome. I'll tell you my meeting Bill Clinton, the first time I met Bill Clinton. It's an awesome story. Hmm? Well, actually, it wasn't like, hey, how are you doing, Joey? I can't do his voice, but. No, it was, uh. Just shook his hand twice, but the first one's a really good story. Uh, Ms. Bosch was part of the Peace Corps, by the way, for example, and a few other. You know, it's a, it's it actually it's a really neat thing. I, I thought about it, but then I, I don't know. I didn't. Also, Kennedy, the space race. Remember, I talked about NASA. It's a defense program, and this became a big part of the Cold War to match the Soviets. You got a man in or man in space first, a man in orbit first, spacewalk first. The U.S. appeared to be behind, even though in reality the U.S. was technologically way ahead. But in 62, Kennedy would pledge that the Americans are going to do what by the end of the decade? Get a man on the moon, man on the moon, and even get him back. Yeah, there was talk about, well, why don't we just get some guy, you know, to take one for the team, so to speak, and just get him back. And then they decided, no, that would look really bad. <laughs> oh, but the first really big thing, the Bay of Pigs. When Kennedy was president, it's called the Bay of Pigs incident, and that was that CIA operation to attack Cuba. And it's April 1961. Kennedy didn't like this program. Not that Kennedy didn't like secret programs. He liked these kind of secret operations. But it's not his program. If it if it fails, he'll get all the blame. But they assured him it would work. So, April, they attacked it's a little bay here called the Bay of Pigs. And the assumption was the Cuban people would rise up and join the exile army. 
The CIA was equipping them as all a secret operation, even though Cuba knew he was doing it. It didn't work. The people joined Castro, and there's Castro at the front. 61. It's only a month and a half after he's inaugurated. It failed miserably. In fact, the CIA almost immediately said, uh, we need the Navy. We need, we had a couple aircraft carriers off the coast. We need them to start bombing. And Kennedy refused, basically realized this might be World War III. Kennedy is going to be then bitterly attacked for being soft on communism. And he would take all the blame for Bay of Pigs. And the thing was, from the Bay of Pigs on, Kennedy had to prove he's top on communists. In fact, this is going to be his biggest issue. In every speech, he's going to make sure that he's top on communism. The last speech he was going to give in Dallas, Texas in 1963 was going to be on writing about how well things were going around the world, especially South Vietnam, because he's top on communism. He didn't want to be accused uh, like Truman was in losing China. Bay of Pigs was a disaster. But now, don't forget, Castro is very afraid of invasion now, isn't he? Hmm, you might want missiles. There's a political cartoon, you get it? The Cuban cigar blowing up in his face. Aha! All right, so, in June of 1961, Kennedy and Khrushchev met for a planned summit, kind of a makeup for the disastrous Paris summit back in 61. Kennedy and Khrushchev met, and it was awful. It was a terrible disaster. Kennedy tried to look tough, and he wasn't going to be back down. He wasn't going to let Khrushchev back it down. Khrushchev thought he could bluster and bluff Kennedy and make Kennedy look weak. When they walked out, it looked like war was even closer. It wasn't just the U-2 crisis. It wasn't just Cuba. It was also Berlin. Berlin was a big issue. And so the last thing for today, we're coming up to what's called Berlin or what they call the brain drain. At this time, uh, hopefully I get this up with the bell ring, so I, I got like a minute, right? Huh? At this time, the rule was East and West Berlin didn't have a border. You could go back and forth. It was the only place behind the Iron Curtain where you could do this. And so what's happening, it's why it's called the brain drain. Young, intelligent, well-educated people realizing that the promises of a socialist world behind the Iron Curtain was a lie. It's actually an awful totalitarian state. They were crossing into the West and not coming back. It started with a couple hundred a month at the end of the 1950s. By 1961, over 1,500 a month. People from like Poland or Czechoslovakia were going there. Khrushchev is the All right. Tomorrow, Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy's assassination, and into Vietnam. We'll finish with 68 through Nixon on Monday. What do we have on Monday? Oh, did I give you your assignment? No. I didn't give you your assignment. Sorry. You forgive me? I'm going to give it to you. 491. You have to. You have to do the questions on 491. Eight questions. And one more little thing. I am going to give you the key for the practice test again in chapter 2. Okay. Yeah. And I'm um, it's. I'm going to sign the last the Titus 3 and 31 on that one. And it's not true. I'm going to watch it today. It is actually here. Every year it's like Yeah. It seems like it's a long way. We're never going to finish, but we're done. Right now? Hey, you guys want a test? Nope, you don't get one. You get quiz. And it's all going to be on credit default swaps. And I hope you study tranches. Ooh, I forgot. Did I mention tranches? That's the thing about this kind of test. I try to keep, you know, there's so much I can use. It's so complex.
I don't want to get into too many details where you get kind of almost down the one hole. Uh, Dexter, we had a meeting of the council. The council met. And you failed. You've got to get that Here's your bride. But it's a bride. Can I do the killer? And then get an A on the test. You want my stories in Malta? Yeah. That's worth nothing. Oh, yeah, this is just a, it takes like a dollar and a half to get these. <laughs> so, like, so you're claiming that you killed you're the Zodiac killer? We gotta tell somebody. I just told you. Let me think. I mean, I don't have to. The problem is that. That's what we see. I tell you what. After you know the quiz, I will let you look at the list. In fact, I'll let you go ahead and check out a Chromebook. I feel that you should, if you have time, you should have time. And you can start looking up some of these things, see if you want to like, but who else wants to do the Zodiac color? No one. No. <laughs> Michelle, no five people more is there. No. Okay, good. Why did you? We might go. I kind of want to show it. We really should. The man, that is, it was a major TV movie, huh. and it's, it's really good. It's the actor they have is creepier than creepy. What movie is this? It's called Helter Skelter about the Manson killing. It's one of the best I've seen. It wasn't like pretty sensational. It does a really good job. It focuses on the actual the arrest. And the prosecuting attorney did a book called Helter Skelter. What's Helter Skelter, by the way? It's a fairground slide in Liverpool. Who gets slide? And Paul McCartney wrote a song about it. On the white album. Yeah, you know nothing. It's called the white owl because it's. Huh? Yeah. And it's the white owl because Sergeant Pepper's in such a. Had so much stuff on the album that McCartney yeah. decided to go white to make it kind of. It's actually the album's called Usually, it's a good album. Not a good album. I don't like Revolution, but not. Oh my God. <laughs> Gross. Not a fan. <laughs> they begged him not to put it on. Any questions? Last minute. You will need a sheet of paper. Are there any like short ideas? Yeah. Uh, Only three. Don't whine. You attacked me. That's what I was told. Why did I hear you say that? And I made it very clear. I wanted that like, secret service to jump in front of me and take, and take the lot of paper. Take one. When I came in doing that, I was thinking. All right, are there any last minute questions? Cole, how are you? Huh? How are you? Yeah, I'm doing it on the chat, you know? I get to see you almost every day. All right, when you're done, pick up. This is a bunch of mysteries and your assignment. Oh, go ahead and take out your worksheet for any quality draw and do turn that in right now. I'll make a trade with you. You can write on this. You can. Don't put answers down though. Just draw pictures. Be kind of abstract. Oh yeah, you can write on you can stand on. Yeah. You're what? You need paper? Oh, just, just get it out. You have your own it's only, I think, 22 matching. And then, when you are done, go ahead and just take, I'll let you borrow a Chromebook, you can start looking through them, and then I'll answer questions when everyone is done.
Oh, good. Okay. It's just oh, right with it. Seven and the square root of Cleveland. Yes. No, like I was looking at really awesome. Do you want to talk about what happened? I didn't answer those. I don't know. I did this. There's some questions. I should have asked this question. 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 So it's not a big deal. I didn't even think about that. Oh, I should have asked that question. All right. Here we go. There's a lot. I picked. When you get this sheet, I picked a number of mysteries. Some are really famous ones. Some are a little bit more obscure. There's a lot of other mysteries, but there wouldn't be enough information I thought to do a presentation. So I try to narrow it down. But there's a couple. There's a couple of pretty good ones from Montana. That are pretty, they're pretty serious, but I just frankly wouldn't get enough information. Unless you want to do it all over the world. Yeah, I can tell you. They're mostly pretty serious. Or does he do it? Is it? Yeah. There's some really. Uh, all right. Tessera, you can write on You do your matching on this, and then the three short ideas. I'll only give you three in this row. Tyler, go back. Please let me know if I made a typo. Yes. Thank you. 